Okay, hi everybody. So uh, in this short lecture, we're going to talk about what could possibly go wrong with mutual exclusion. Uh, so we've talked about mutual exclusion a lot. We've talked about how great it is, but we've also mentioned there's some problems with it if we do not do it correctly. Uh, and oftentimes this means we're talking about deadlocks. So in this short lecture, uh, we hope to give examples of deadlocks. We want you to know deadlocks well enough, what deadlocks are, how do they happen. We want to be able to describe that well enough that you could write some code uh, that causes a deadlock. Uh, of course, we wouldn't intentionally want to do that, but understanding how you would write it is part of understanding how not to do that. Uh, maybe you also could figure out how to fix deadlocks in deadlocking code. That is uh, a goal after this lecture. So we'll discuss that. And as part of that, we'll discuss the four conditions required for deadlocking and also how we can solve these deadlocks by invalidating one of these conditions. Uh, we'll get into details about what that means as we move forward. So mutexes can help prevent data races. We know this, we talked about this in the last video. We have a function f here uh, that has a mutex and a variable v. These are references, and so all 50 of our threads share these two objects. And uh, we perform some very simple incrementation on it, ensuring that we lock before we access v so that we have mutual exclusion. So let's make this a little more complicated. Let's have a situation where we need to execute two functions. So some threads will access uh, or will execute function one and some threads will execute function two. So this is a very similar function to the one that we just went over, except now we have two mutexes in play. So in F1, um, what will happen is we'll execute this line will grab lock one. You can consider that we've grabbed the lock is how we might refer to those. Uh, then we'll grab lock two. Now we're holding two locks. We are we're holding two shared resources. We increment V, then we release the lock on mutex two, then we release the lock on mutex one, okay? Uh, in function two, we do basically the same thing but we grab the locks in reverse order and we release them in reverse order. So this is a very uh, simplistic way to demonstrate what can cause a deadlock, but this kind of scenario, in fact, this may be so simple, you might ask why would this, th this is a silly example um, once we go through it. But this kind of thing happens all the time because code is almost never as simple as what we're demonstrating here and it's easy to get confused how you're accessing locks, what order you're accessing locks in. So if thread one is executing, thread one might grab lock one. Well, if thread two is also executing, it might grab lock two. Then thread one will try to grab lock two. Well, thread two has lock two. So we'll wait, we'll just wait a minute um, to see if we can grab lock two. In the meantime, thread two here is grabbing lock one or trying to, except thread one has lock one. So thread two has lock two and needs lock one. Thread one has lock one and needs lock two. Uh, we're stuck. There's no way for us to get out of this situation. Thread one can never have lock two because thread two has it. And thread two can never have lock one because thread one has it. And since there's no way for our code to continue executing, we are deadlocked. Uh, and this code will just hang forever. Um, you know, when this happens in real life, maybe uh, you make a request to a web page and it never comes back and it times out. Or maybe you have some, some other system that you're running. Uh, it will just hang. Uh, this can happen on your own computer. Maybe you're running Windows and you get a message like, uh, such and such took too long to respond. 
one possibility for your programming ta program taking too long to respond is all your threads are stuck. Uh, so this is bad, clearly. This, this defeats the purpose of what we're trying to do. Uh, this, this is a negative scenario. We want to avoid this when we write our programs. So uh, deadlock has been shown to only happen if four conditions are true. And these are the Kaufman conditions based on the author of the paper that demonstrated this. So these four conditions, one, mutual exclusion. Uh, some resources are held exclusively by a thread, our locks, for example. We're holding the locks. The locks are held by that thread and only that thread. Uh, we have hold and wait. So threads holding a resource wait on another resource. So we're holding one resource, we're waiting on lock two, right? Uh, then we have the case of no preemption. So nobody can force you to let go of one of your locks, which is true for at least for the mutexes we've looked at. Nobody, no other thread, no system operation can force you to let go of that lock. Um, and then finally, circular weight. So circular weight can happen. Uh, the example we just looked at is an example of circular weight. Thread one is waiting on thread two, who's waiting on thread one, who's waiting on thread two. It creates a circle. So these four conditions have to be true uh, to create deadlock. And so we want to avoid these conditions, uh, at least one of these conditions when possible. Oftentimes the one we choose to avoid is circular weight. Make sure threads are not dependent on each other. But there are other ways that we can do this. You avoid this condition when you write sequential code all the time because you, you don't have um, you know, several of these conditions, right? We don't have the same concerns. Um, okay, so moving on, um, there are some strategies we can, we can use to take uh, to, to avoid this scenario. So an example is lock ordering. So if we ensure that locks are always taken in the same order and then released in the correct order, then circular weight cannot be true. You can see in our previous slide how that we got in trouble because we grab mutex one first here and mutex two first here, okay? Uh, if F1 and F2 were identical, or we were only using F1, then we wouldn't have the problem that we had. So you want to, you possibly want to enforce a lock order uh, in the event that you actually need to grab access to multiple resources at the same time. Uh, backing off, so this is also a strategy. Uh, so for example, if you grab a thread, maybe you wait a little while to grab your second resource, and if you fail to grab the resource, you just let go of your first lock and you let somebody else have it, and we agree to try again later, okay? This invalidates the hold and wait condition from our previous slide. Uh, another strategy is canceling transactions. So this is a databases example. If two transactions try to write tables in different orders, one of these transactions could be canceled, uh, which will uh, revert the changes that uh, take place. This is an example of introducing preemption to your um, condition. You, you have a case where we, we can preempt our right. We'll just cancel one of them and force it to um, you know, revert its changes and carry on as we did before. Maybe we reissue the transaction. Maybe we come up with some strategy for how to pursue this. Um, but, well, anyway, I digress. These are the three, uh, these are three strategies. Uh, of course, there are other strategies that we can use. The key goal of each of these strategies is just to invalidate one of the conditions. Uh, if we can invalidate one of the four conditions, then we have no deadlock. And so this is a really crucial concept to uh, designing more complex parallel programming or programs. 
Uh, and that's really all there is for this lecture. Um, the key things are that we want to make sure that we understand our four conditions and describe um, how they happen, why they cause an issue, and a few strategies for how to fix them, right? We just want to understand, uh, you know, at a basic level that, uh, you know, you don't want to create all four of these conditions simultaneously uh, when we use locks. We want to be careful with how we use locks and plan for how they will be used. When will they be locked? When will they be unlocked? What order will they be locked in? Uh, so with that, we'll wrap up. Again, here are some resources that you can check out if you would like some more information on these topics. Um, and we'll see you next lecture.